10 seconds. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. In your face, all over the place. We're online 24 7, 24 7. You're listening to the hottest internet station from beautiful Saline in southeastern Michigan. Around the world at sunskymysteries.com. This is the 2009 Top 10 Webcam in the World winner. This is S E. Well, good evening, everybody. Today is October 8, 2012. My name is Bill Zam. Welcome to a brand new episode of Surrounded by Idiots. When I last left you, I was having trouble with my voice was all um, had to do with the illness that I have been suffering from. Um, as uh, most of you know, I had a uh, real bad infection in my lungs that got into my heart and was in my rib cage and everything else. And Well, I was basically uh, bedridden for uh, a few weeks, couldn't really do anything, couldn't talk more than two or three words at a time. And as uh, the virus left me, I started having uh, tests and going to see specialists and everything. And the last time I was on the show, I got a sore throat after about 15 minutes. And, uh, well, we had to stop the show. Now, last week, to bring everybody up to date, I went in to the hospital. <clears throat> I actually saw a specialist first, a, um, a cardiac specialist, a heart specialist, very nice guy, <clears throat> up at uh, the Michigan Heart Institute, and um, he uh, decided that he wanted to have a test done. I uh, sort of thought it was a stab in the dark, but uh, he, he said, uh, we're going to have this done, and uh, we'll see where it goes from there, and uh, I want you to wear a heart monitor. So right now, right here on the show... I am wearing a heart monitor right here, and I'm all wired up and hooked up to this heart monitor, where I will be hooked up for the next month. I have to wear this stupid thing 24 hours a day. I've also started using something that I used when I was running marathons. Um, people that are very serious about running marathons... Um, what uh, we do, or I did, in my case, I can no longer run as long as I did. Um, what you do is, if you're very serious about it, you have to train, and you have to train very hard. You have to train all the time. To train for a specific marathon, you have to train up to two years, and a lot of these uh, people that uh, run in um, marathons, what they do is uh, they'll run um, like little podunk marathons and half marathons just to get warmed up for the big one that they want to win. One of the tools that you use is a heart monitor. And I've been wearing my old heart monitor right here. This is a cardio sport heart monitor. It, um, you can see it's uh, basically a strap. It goes around your chest. <clears throat> is where this goes and it has uh, I don't know if you can see it on the camera it's got a bunch of little um, indentations here and a couple little sensors here and it basically takes the place of all of these little stickers and everything that you have on yourself when you get an EKG and you have a little wristwatch and it communicates wirelessly between the two of them and it shows you your heart rate and you can set it for a high heart rate and a low heart rate so you can run within and train within your target heartbeat range and I've been wearing this to keep an eye on uh, what's going on with my heart and the uh, heart rate and everything else because this gizmo here of course doesn't show you that but <clears throat> I uh, went in 
to uh, St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and uh, they did what's called a tilt table test on me. Now, let me tell you something. These tilt tables, I got a picture of it right here. Here's what it looks like. There's a tilt table that I was on. These tilt tables, let me tell you something. These things are left over from the Inquisition. I'm positive of it. Because they uh, take you in there, they strap you down, they hook you up with, to a heart monitor and an automatic blood pressure thing, and uh, they put a blanket over you and everything, and you're wearing a little hospital gown. And um, then they take the table and they tilt it so that you're standing upright like this, and you have to talk all the way through it. And <clears throat> they keep asking you how you feel, and yada, yada, yada. And if you don't um, get dizzy or uh, have an episode, they give you a nitroglycerin tablet. Now, everybody's heard of nitroglycerin tablets. When somebody has um, chest pain, like angina, what they do is they prescribe you nitroglycerin. And what it does is it dilates all the blood vessels in your body. And it dilates the blood vessels, makes them bigger, and lo and behold, the chest pain goes away because the blood is flowing very freely now. What they do to test the particular condition that I have, and apparently it's been diagnosed now, is they give you the nitroglycerin tablet and wait and see what happens. Normally, if you have the condition that I do, you um, faint. Um, in my particular case, about two minutes after I put the nitroglycerin tablet under my tongue, my blood pressure went down to zero, and my heart rate went down to zero. So, I suppose technically for a few seconds there, or a few minutes, I don't know how long I was out, I was, um, for all intents and purposes, dead. But I came to a few minutes later, they had a saline, uh, saline drip in my um, arm, and uh, they were rehydrating me and everything, and they tell me that uh, what I have, I have the handy dandy information sheet right here. It is called neurocardiogenic cinescope and um, it has many uh, different features and many different um, um, symptoms including uh, an inability to talk for a long time more than briefly and you get a hoarse voice so far though I seem to be doing good and now while I was out and technically dead there on the table. I had an interesting visit with a uh, fella, and uh, I have a message from everybody, from God, and that message is, quit screwing around. You're going to put somebody's eye out. And there you go. Now, it's been a while since I've done a show, and I had, uh, oh, I don't know, about a million different stories all set up since the end of September. And um, I've been working on a way to get the show to everybody, even though I can't do the show. As you know, we have what we call show notes, which is uh, right here. There's the show notes. Uh, those of you that have seen the show, it's very familiar to you. What I'm doing is I'm putting all of the show notes that I'm putting together up at ussamichigan.com. You can see the uh, right down here in the corner, right there. There's the website address, ussamichigan.com. It's where you go to watch the show live, and it's also where we're going to put our show archives. So we have been putting them there. Um, so that's about it that's been happening with me. And, of course, I have uh, my uh, fingers on the pulse of America, as it were, and I have been paying attention to everything that's going on. You'll have to excuse me just for a second. I need to put on uh, a jacket because I am still extremely temperature sensitive. Even though I'm uh, sort of doing okay. If I can find the other arm of the jacket, that'd be absolutely fantastic. you have to pardon me here just for a second. There we go. Incidentally, I've been uh, keeping an eye on my heart rate. 
it hardly ever falls below 90 beats a minute, which is insane. Even when I'm sleeping, it's just racing along like a racehorse. I almost never get down to a uh, resting heart rate anymore. It's very uh, cumbersome. It's hard to sleep when your heart's pounding away. But at least the blood's flowing through my veins. Um, incidentally, I forgot one thing. The condition that I have is caused by a disconnect of the vagus nerve, V-A-G-U-S. There's uh, two vagus nerves that come down from the uh, base of your brain. Um, one goes to the um, heart, and the other one goes to um, the organs, like the stomach and the spleen and everything else, and instructions are passed back and forth. In my particular case, and in a lot of other people's cases, as it turns out, there is a lack of communication. Something happens to the vagus nerve, and it can't communicate with the heart. So when I stand up, I get lightheaded. I get these splitting headaches all of a sudden, like I have right now, and all sorts of other stuff. Anyways, let's get on with the uh, main part of the show. I'm planning on going for half an hour tonight. I have far more material than a, uh, that will, far, two hours worth of stuff is what I have for tonight, so we'll put it up on uh, ussamichigan.com, and it'll be um, up in the show archives. A lot of uh, people have uh, emailed me, and um, I've had conversations with with uh, a lot of people, and they ask me, Bill, what did you think of that first debate? What did you, uh, what was your take on it? And um, what I've been doing is I've been paying attention to the media to the uh, mainstream media and uh, all of the various talk shows and hosts and everybody uh, basically melting down. Bill Maher said he was sorry he gave the guy a million dollars because he thinks he blew it all on pot. But here is my take. At this point, the um, and it was just, it was, I don't know if you watched it, it was bizarre. That's all I can say about it. It was just plain bizarre. I ain't never seen anything like it. And I watched, I'm old enough that I watched, I've watched every debate that has been televised all the way back to Jerry Ford. That's how far, and Richard Nixon. I remember watching Richard Nixon debating. And it's, this one was just so bizarre. There's, there's never been such a, dichotomy between the two debaters. And what we're being told now by the minions is that Obama didn't say his lines right. In other words, he went off script during the debate. It's like an actor, not someone who believes his convictions to the center of his soul. So you and I I don't care if you're a liberal or not. I really don't. I don't care if you're a Christian. I don't care if you're a Buddhist. I really don't care. You believe right to the center of your soul you, with, with conviction, with faith, with strength, what you believe in. I have my convictions. You guys know that. You have your convictions. And we're being led to believe that Obama went off, didn't follow the script they had set up for him. He didn't say his lines right, like he's an actor or something. Now, Bob Schieffer, uh, uh, over this past weekend, yesterday, on uh, Deface the Nation, he asked um, Axelrod about uh, what the heck was going on in that debate. And basically, he said, say, Dave, what the hell happened? We gave you guys the 47% video clip. We gave you the dog on the roof thing. We've been ripping Romney for two years for you guys and handed it to you on a silver platter. What happened? And this is um, Axelrod's response to that first question. 
Romney showed up to deliver a performance, and he delivered a very good performance. It was completely unrooted in fact. It was completely unrooted in the positions he's taken before, and he spent 90 minutes trying to undo two years of uh, campaigning on that stage, but he did it very well. What, uh, are you saying that uh, Governor Romney lied or was dishonest? Well, yeah, I think he was dishonest, absolutely. Would you go so far as to say he lied? Well, I'm, not, I, I'm saying that he was dishonest in his uh, answers. You can characterize that any way you want. So, there you go. That's uh, David Axelrod's take on poor Barack. He got blindsided by Romney. And what they're saying is they actually believe the lives they've been telling about Romney. And lo and behold, a totally different Romney shows up. And poor Barack Hussein Obama was so confused he forgot his lines. That's insane. What we got was Romney pointing out and shining light on Nir Obama's total failure to do anything of substance in almost four years. And I've got another audio clip from Deface the Nation. Now they want to know why the hell Obama didn't jump up and down screaming Liar, liar, pants on fire. So when you say that he was dishonest and you went through those series of things where you think the, that uh, Mitt Romney was dishonest, why didn't the president make that point in the debate? I think he was a little taken aback at the, uh, at the, the brazenness with which Governor Romney walked away from so many uh, of the positions on which he's run, walked away from his record. And, I, and uh, you know, that's something we're going to have to make an adjustment for in these uh, subsequent debates. So you admit you were surprised by that, that the president was surprised by that. So what I think would anybody, he do differently? anybody think... would be. I mean, it takes a certain, as President Clinton would say, it takes a certain brass to do what Governor Romney did there. Yeah, so... <clears throat> Um, we're led to believe that Barack Obama, oh, hold on a second, I have an incoming phone, phone. it's a, <laughs> it's a, <laughs> it's somebody that wants my opinion about something, <clears throat> they're not going to get it, if they want to get my opinion on anything, they can watch surrounded by idiots. They don't need to call me on the phone to take part in some stupid survey. We're led to believe that Obama, who learned and has friends with the names with names like Farrakhan, Jeremiah Wright, Bill Ayers, and Tony Rezko, we're led to believe now that Obama just can't deal with nefarious characters. And he hangs out with them. He calls them friends. <clears throat> this was probably the first time in four years, and probably a lot, lot longer than that, that someone has had the guts to say, you know what, you're full of it, pal. You're pattering around like a 15-year-old, know-it-all, and the only thing you're doing is ruining this country. And Obama just couldn't take it. That's basically my take on what happened. Um... What happened was the Messiah got uh, got a big-ass can of Romney whoop-ass opened up on him, and he didn't know how to deal with it. And that is supposed to be the leader of the free world? <laughs> Give me a break. Anyways, there's um, another story that uh, I've been following. Hold on right here. Okay. I'm going to skip a couple of stories. They will be in the show notes at the website in the show archives for you to read. You remember the news story from about 2010 about how yard sales... Let me get down to that story here. You remember back in 2010, 2009 actually, about how yard sales were going to be made illegal? Probably not, but you have me to rely on. I happen to have uh, parts of that article right here. The way it was foisted upon us in 2009 that it was a quote-unquote product safety issue, and your yard sale is illegal, pal. 
against the law. Here's your quote right from the freaking handbook that the government handed out in 2009. Here's from the handbook. This handbook will help sellers of used products identify types of potentially hazardous products that could harm children or others. CPSC's laws and regulations apply to anyone who sells or distributes consumer products. This includes thrift stores, consignment stores, charities, and individuals holding yard sales and flea markets. Selling old kids' books, anything with metal, paint, or plastic that a kid might use, old clothes or shoes with metal components that a kid might wear. You know any of the stuff people routinely sell at yard sales. Technically, you could be on the hook for thousands of dollars in fines. And right here, I have a link to the original article. Let me see if I can bring it up here. Da, 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 da. This is from uh, Reason.com. I'm bringing up the full website. I don't usually do that. Um, and you can see they talked about it back then. There is a image of the cover of the CPSC handbook. Um, and the article is fairly short, but this person, uh, Catherine Mangu Ward, uh, back in 2009, in May of 2009, I remember all the uh, hoop de doo about this, and uh, she was writing about that. Well, unfortunately, that little plan didn't work. So they moved right on to the copyright of the product is owned by the company that made it, so you can't sell it as a private citizen. In other words, what they're saying, and you're not going to believe this. If you haven't heard about this already, you need to be sitting down, get yourself an adult beverage. You're going to need at least two or three to make it through this particular story. Apparently, what some bright boy has done is they've actually made a law that says that you and I, if I, um, here we go, right here. I got uh, something right here that actually falls within the purview of this, of this particular law. Right here. This is my digital camera right here. And this is my uh, digital audio recorder that I use for field recordings and uh, recording sound clips and things like that. This is made by Sony. And uh, this is made by Kodak. Now, Kodak is an American company. Sony is a Japanese company. According to this law, I can take this, apparently, and um, sell it on eBay or a yard sale or where, where have you, you know, wherever you want to. You can put an ad on Craigslist. This, however, since it wasn't made in this country, the copyright on this product, the copyright on the product, not the name itself, is held by the Sony Corporation. Therefore, it is illegal for me to sell this as a used item without compensating the Sony Corporation. Believe it or not, this crap has actually made it all the way up to the Supreme Court. I have an article right here. Um, let's go back over to the show notes. Um, it's at the Supreme Court now, and it can affect your life in ways you simply cannot get your head around. For instance, you go to sell your car yourself instead of trading it in. Under this law, already on the books, the manufacturer owns the copyright of that car, and you can't sell it. Same with everything from socks to an old television. If the Supremes hold... Up, uphold this thing, eBay, yard sales, just about every used merchandise sale or purchase will be illegal. And we have that right here. This is from Market Watch. Um, the link to right to the original article is right here in the show notes. So you can go here and read this yourself. This is by Jennifer Waters over at Market Watch. Tucked into the Supreme Court's agenda this fall is a little-known case that could upend your ability to resell everything from your grandmother's antique furniture to your iPhone 4. At issue is Kurt Sang versus John Wiley and Sons. 
is the first sale doctrine in copyright law, which allows you to buy and then sell things like electronics, books, artwork, and furniture, as well as CDs and DVDs without getting permission from the copyright holder of those pro products. Under this doctrine, which the Supreme Court has recognized since 1908, you can resell your stuff without worry because the copyright holder only had control over the first sale. In other words, after you buy it, this crap's yours. They only have control over the first sale, the sale to you, the original owner. After that, it's yours to do with as you please. That is what the Supreme Court has upheld since 1908. But times have changed. Simply put, though Apple Inc. has the copyright on the iPhone and Mark Owen has it on the book, No Easy Day, you can still sell your copies to whomever you please whenever you want without retribution. That's being challenged now for products that are made abroad. Uh, my Sony uh, recorder. And if the Supreme Court upholds an appellate court ruling, it could mean that copyright holders of anything you own that has been made in China, Japan, or Europe, for example, would have to give you permission to sell it. And that's where you enter, from what I've been able to tell from the legal discussions, that's where you enter a gray area with things like my Kodak camera, because this was made for Kodak in China. The Logitech webcam that we're using for the show, under this law, I can't sell it because Logitech had it made in China. Same thing for my laptop, for all of my computers. Um, <clears throat> my Dodge truck was made in the U.S., so technically, I guess I could probably sell it. But my wife's car is a, uh, is a Toyota, so... She can't sell it used. It means that it's harder for consumers to buy used products and harder for them to sell them, said Jonathan Bann, an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center, who filed a friend of the court brief on behalf of the American Library Association, the Association of College and Research Libraries, and the Association for research libraries. This has a huge consumer impact on all consumer groups. Another likely result is that it would hit you financially because the copyright holder would now want a piece of that sale. Got that? Another phone call. Hold on one moment. I have to take this call. I will play some music, and we'll be right back. I am back. Believe it or not, this time I actually remembered to mute the microphone and take it off a of mute. Uh, it was um, one of the presidential candidates asking for my opinion. I'll have to call him back in a few minutes because I'm on the air. I'm doing something important. So, anyways, this uh, particular um, ruling, this um, case that's before the Supreme Court, it could... <clears throat> The impl there, let me read from this article. It could be your personal electronic devices or the family jewels that have been passed down from your great-grandparents who immigrated from Spain. It could be a book that was written by an American writer but printed and bound overseas or an Italian painter's artwork. Got that? If you own a original Renoir, well... Somebody else needs to get a cut of that action. There are implications for a wide variety of U.S. wide-ranging 
There are implications for a variety of wide-ranging U.S. entities, including libraries, musicians, museums, and even resale juggernauts like eBay and Craigslist. U.S. libraries, for example, carry some 200 million books from foreign publishers. It would be absurd to say that a anything manufactured abroad can't be bought or sold here, said Marvin Amory a First Amendment lawyer and Schwartz Fellow at the New American Foundation who specializes in technology issues. And you can read that article by following the link that I have in the show notes. And my comment on this um, those of you with delicate ears, you're probably going to want to plug your ears for a minute. My comment on this is that what it amounts to is that these little shits are serious about their communism, socialism, Nazism, and any other ism that you want to name that puts them in charge of you and what you do. So buckle under, comrade, or you shall be re-educated probably by some 20-year-old brainwashed snot that knows more than you do. So, the Supremes have to, they absolutely have to strike down this law, because otherwise, <laughs> eh, eh, it's not going to be good. The Salvation Army thrift stores, they're going to be out of business. eBay, they're pretty much going to be out of business. Craigslist, <laughs> you're going to, I mean, you're going to have to seek permission to sell an audio recorder from Sony, and you're going to have to give them a cut of the action. What a bunch of crap. That's all i got to say about it. And i got a sore throat just from talking about that. Not even worth it. Which can only mean one thing. It can only mean one thing, folks. I am getting the hell off this planet. Who's with me? Come on. Who wants to get off the planet? You, let's just leave Earth behind. And that'll be it. We're done. We're going we're gonna to go ahead and leave because a Mars settlement town has been planned for 2023. That's right. A new private space firm from the Netherlands called Mars One is attempting to send four astronauts on a one-way journey to Mars in 2023. The company intends to create a habitable settlement that will support settlers while they live and work on Mars. What kind of work they do, we don't know. Maybe they'll be working for eBay. Every two years, after 2023, an additional crew will arrive, enabling what they describe as a real living, growing community on Mars. The pitch is simple. A Mars mission that will allow the participants to immigrate to the red planet never to return. The trip will be one way, allowing those who go to live and work on Mars for the rest of their godforsaken lives. The company says a return ticket is pretty much impossible when talking about the red planet. Let's go to uh, right here let's go to the Mars One website that's uh, mars-one.com and there you go they're not kidding around <clears throat> and neither was I I want to get the hell off this planet there you go there's a picture of uh, what the habitats look like they're even selling Mars One t-shirts and uh, you can see the Habitats right there, the artist conception of them, and uh, they're planning on um, using these things to uh, build a settlement on Mars in 2023. And you know what? In 2023, I'll only be 64 years old. <laughs> so, of course, <clears throat> since they're going to be broadcasting this thing 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from the red planet. They're obviously going to need a broadcast professional up there to run the equipment and host the reality show. So, <laughs> they've accepted my application. I'm uh, going to be uh, going to Mars in 2023. So, in uh, a few years, it's going to be surrounded by idiots on Mars. And uh, there's, since there's only going to be three other idiots it's going to be pretty uh, apparent 
who I'm talking about. <laughs> At any rate, that's uh, about it for tonight. Incidentally, the uh, sinkhole down there in Assumption Parish in Louisiana is um, roiling and bubbling merrily away. It is uh, apparently the video that I saw the other day, it has now swallowed a boat. Um, it appears that uh, all of the salt domes are in the process of collapsing. There are now tremors up to 45 miles away. There are uh, gas bubbles coming up through the ground um, almost 20 miles away now. And if you know your geology, and, um, well, it doesn't matter, strike that, forget that. That was a stupid comment. The way the geology works out is this is part of uh, the, the uh, Mississippi Canyon, or whatever they call it, that extends out to the Gulf of Mexico that, oddly enough, the BP oil well is connected to. Last weekend, the Coast Guard was out at the site of the BP oil well disaster to investigate reports of new oil slicks that are coming up from the bottom of the Gulf. So the thing's leaking. They told us that it probably was when the disaster occurred because there's a lot of pressure down there. So there are so many little aspects to this, it's incredible. This spot in Louisiana where the salt domes are, this stuff is connected to the New Madrid. It goes out into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, part of our national oil reserves are there. Um, what was it? Uh, Eight billion cubic feet of natural gas were stored into things. Um, butane was stored in one of these uh, salt domes. There are some of the main supply lines for gas, natural gas, fuel oil, and gasoline for the East Coast that run right through there. If those things get split, where are you going to get your uh, supplies from? Uh, apparently, there's no real viable alternative way to do that from what I have been led to believe. Um, I'm going to be doing some more research on that in the near future to find out it, to find out what um, types of supply pipelines there are that deliver gas and oil, natural gas, heating oil, and gasoline from the refineries on the Texas coast to the eastern seaboard. Um, I don't know if there's any alternative routes or not. They have found uh, some intense bubbling that's probably from a cracked pipeline uh, some miles away from the um, sinkhole. Um, you want to go to, let me see if I can pull the site up here. Let me see if I can remember the name of the site. Hold on for just one second. Okay, N-E. The site that you want to go to to get the news is called anynews.com. E-N-E. Edward Nancy Edward News.com. They have all kinds of uh, information right here. Let's look at this story right here while we're still on the air. Unknown gas trapped in giant sinkhole prompts new concern. Vent wells being dug in the four acre slurry. Clay layer may not hold if pressure increases. Um, another story here, legal expert. A legal expert says this is an incredibly dangerous situation. Local officials very concerned gas could burst through ground with explosive force. Now, also remember that that explosive force, that gas is flammable, highly flammable. Um, a lot of it is methane. Um, Methane is a intense greenhouse gas, not like um, not like um, um, the uh, carbon dioxide everybody's whining and crying about. This methane is far more of a greenhouse gas. Um, keep in mind that there are frozen methane hydrates at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, 
where the oil well was. If those things break loose and come up to the top and dissolve, they'll put a tremendous amount of methane in the air. And then the only thing you're going to be hearing is... <laughs> as the temperature goes up and up and up from this greenhouse gas. That would be truly a, ep a natural disaster of epic proportions. And you can tell how big of a problem it is, it is because none of the mainstream media are even covering it. And if something does happen, if something really bad does happen down there, they're going to cover it like, oh, what a big surprise. We didn't know about it. When in fact, Many, many, many people already know about it, and they are doing a terrible disservice to the part of the public, the sheeple, that actually watch mainstream news now. They, um, it's, uh, it's a bad situation down there, and it is continuing to get worse and worse and worse. And here's the thing. There's no way humans have no technology and no type of engineering to stop this. The only thing they can do is watch and happen. That's all we can do as human beings. We can't do anything. This is truly an uh, epic disaster. You need to keep looking into it and you need to keep going to any news, enenews.com, because they have the latest headlines. So, my name is Bill Zam. Um, later tonight or tomorrow morning, we will have the uh, um, show archive up on uh, ussamichigan.com, and we will also have the show notes at the same site. So, until the next time, hopefully tomorrow night, my name is Bill Sam. Thank you for showing up, and um, I'm going to go uh, watch my heart monitor some more, and uh, hopefully... I won't have a heart attack or something. See you guys later. Thanks for showing up. I really appreciate it.